Welcome to another class of analysis of Boolean functions. And today we continue with hyperconvertivity and we prove the full result. So let me share my screen. Okay, so, so let's just start right away and prove the main result of today. Okay. And this will be the hyperconvertivity real real hyperconvertivity, which is uh, flat one less so you call infinity less less infinity. Um, whole real and such that We have this. Um, then the norm P, norm Q, sorry, is less so equal to norm P. Okay. For every F from the Hemi cube which is real. Okay, so this is real hyperconvertivity. And that's the result we're gonna to prove today. Okay. Um, before we show it, let me make it some observations. Um, so the first observation is that, well, since Ho is, well, this is a number less or equal to one because Q is larger than P. Um, and so we know that we can write T Ho of F of X as the expectation of F of Y where y is who correlated to x, okay? In particular, that implies that uh, if you do the expectation um, yes, uh, Yes, where um, X and Y are co-correlated, then this thing is exactly the inner product of T over with F. Oh, it's supposed to be F here, let me see. Uh, oh, sorry. That's supposed to be F Y and then G X, of course. And then this is the inner product. Okay, so you can show that because of that definition. In particular, we know that we can show to it is easy to realize that um, let me give a name here, say, so let me see theorem one. Uh, that theorem one is equivalent 
to the following statement. This would be less so equal than the say expectation we write in this way of f one over r raised to one to one one plus r and the expectation of g one plus s raised to one plus s where so the only thing I did, I, I switched it a P to be one plus R and Q to be one plus S. And so that if 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 that is uh, oh sorry, Q prime to be one plus S. So if that's the case, then we have that hyperconductivity should work for any guy, which is less or equal than this. But this is equal to that, where Q, Q prime is the dual exponent. But now this is equal to square root of Rs. Okay, and so, so And so what we're saying here is that uh, an equivalent statement of hypercontractivity is the following. If you want to make a, a say compute the, um, the expectation of f y times g of x, when you couple these variables to be whole correlated, then you can bound that by the say L1 plus R and L1 plus S norms of these functions. And you can choose a smaller norms, that is you can, make, you can reduce R and S um, if you take in a whole, which is uh, small. So for instance, if whole is, um, if whole is zero, so sorry, if, if, if if ho is say, if the functions are not correlated, say if ho is zero, then you can basically take any r and any s here. So you can bound this just by the L1 norms of these of, of this thing. So that means the, the expectation decouples, these, these variables are independent, they're not correlated anymore, and you just have the independence relation, expectation of the products, the product of the expectation. But if, if they have some correlation, then this gives a bound for the norms you can use. So you can also see in that way. Okay, and that's easily, you can easily see that because, well, you know that the norm Q of this function is bounded by the norm P. So that means that you have to put a G, which belongs to L Q prime. Well, Q prime is the dual exponent. Okay, so uh, uh, a corollary of this is the following, um, which is called this small set expansion, which is the following. Suppose you have two sets of the Hamming cube, um, then What's the probability of X belonging to A and Y belonging to B, assuming that X and Y are co-correlated? Okay. Uh, then we have a bound for that. So, so let me assume that the volume of A is, um, which is the size of a divided by two to the n is like e to the minus a squared. And the volume of b is the same. Okay, just to 
facilitate notation. And then what's the bound we have will be bound as the following. We have that bound. Um, and there is also a version with a lower bound for this, where you basically only change that minus to a plus. And this holds because um, you also have a reversed hyperconductivity. You also have an inequality like this, a version of this inequality, but with the opposite uh, direction. But you have to assume that your initial beta is um, E, uh, positive, for instance. Um, but we are not going to explore this here. Um, so, but another way of seeing this, maybe a, a more useful um, inequality, is to see that, well, you have these A's and you have these B here. And so this is the volume again. So if you want to rewrite this in terms of the volume, what you get is that um, this is less or equal than um, um, you, you can bound say B minus a half um, A squared plus B squared minus two whole. And then you can bound this from above by A squared B squared divided by two. So you get just this. And so what you get is e to the minus, uh, oh, divided by one minus whole squared, a half, and then you get one minus whole divided by one minus whole squared. That is, yes. So it's just divided by one plus one plus whole. And then, so this is what? This is volume of a volume of B raised to one divided by one plus four. Um, yes, and of course I have to tell what ho is, ho is because otherwise this doesn't make any sense. So ho here is Uh, ho B say the maxima of A or B divided by the minimum. Uh, oh no, it's the opposite, of course. Who has to be less or equal than one? Okay. Um, then then we have this. Okay, so this is a sort of a better, well, it's slightly weaker than the before, but sort of a better inequality to remember. You can bound this. So again, if, 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 if I can take, Ho equals zero, then, um, oh, sorry, I, I definitely can take ho equals zero. Ho, ho is anything less or equal than that, of course. And what, but of course, that the best bound would be when I increase this ho. And so I could take ho equals zero and just bound by the volume of A times the volume of B, that is fine but you can get a slightly better inequality by including this power here when you take ho equals to that number, okay? So maybe let me just say ho equals that. Okay, so you get a slightly better upper bound. Um, No, oh, sorry, you get it, you get a
yeah, you get what you get because this is yeah, so, so bottom line, what you have here is uh, the higher the hole, the worse the upper bound you get because these are numbers less than one and you and this is smaller than one. So if this is becoming very small, this is becoming closer to one. And so the higher the hole, the worse the bound you get. So if you have very correlated random variables, then uh, that's the bound you can get. Okay, so that's more or less the intuition behind. Okay. Uh, what else I would like to show? Um, so now we can go straight, go to the proof. Proof. So again, now this is a corollary that's easily implied by the hyperconductivity result. Basically, what you have to do is to use f as the function, characteristic function of a, and g as the characteristic function of b, and use this observation here. Okay, um, so we want to prove this result. Okay, how do we prove it? Um, well, we do know certain things already. So we, we do know that we can make a bunch of reductions. So first of all, we can assume n is one. Second reduction, um, we can assume P and Q are both different than two because we already proved the case and P equals P equals two or Q equals two. And also that P is different than Q because we also proved the case P equals Q already. And that just came from the fact that you can write this operator T hole as a convolution and the convolution kernel has is positive and has total mass one. And just by Young's inequality, you get the result. And we can also assume that the input is greater or equal than zero. And that's by the same fact that the kernel is positive. Okay. But if we are in one dimension, that is your function is like a plus bx one, uh, we can always like just multiply and divide by a and assume that this guy is one. And if a was zero, then the result would be trivial. There, there was nothing to do. And so, um, we can assume that a is non-zero, then in factor a, and just have a function like this. And if this is greater or equal than zero, that implies that uh, b is less or equal than one. And just by continuity, uh, we can assume b is less than one. Um, and if just changing b by minus b, you can assume that just this is true for say to even make it simpler. Okay. So now we just have to prove a uh, one dimension of inequality for a variable that is between zero and one. And that's it. And what is this one dimension of inequality? Well, it's this one. Oh, there is another one that I forgot. And we can assume the whole equals this guy. Because we saw that if we prove for some whole, then the thing is true for any other whole with the moduli less than the, the given whole. And so we can always assume that we are in the extreme case. And so we have to show this inequality here. Let me just move this 
down a little bit. Down a little bit. And this has to be less or equal than the norm P, which would be exactly the same thing, but without the multiplication. And of course, we have these one over Q, one over P. That's what, what we have to show. So we have to show this that for all we have this. Okay, that's what we have to show. Okay, great. So we reduced everything just to one dimension of inequality. So let me um, raise everything to power P. Okay. Let me expand. So you more or less already know the inequality, the proof of this inequality by my proof for the case equals two. That proof was generalizable. Um, oh, I forgot to mention another reduction that would be important in the point. That, that we will basically generalize that proof for the case P, P equals two or Q equals two. Uh, so we have this, so we have this situation Because after all these reductions, we have this situation, okay? And we know that one implies the other. Okay, so we have, of course, we have still one more. This we didn't rule out. We have these three cases, so maybe you have a like case one or case two or case three. Okay, that's what we have. Let me, it was too quick here. Yes. Okay. Okay, so this was the, we had these three cases. Uh, and then my claim is um, we only need to prove one. And why? Well, trivially, one is equivalent to two, and this is by duality. So recall that we had this P equals two case and we have the case Q equals two and they would do it to each other. So if we prove one, we prove the other. Um, and so the same thing happens here and then we leave as an exercise. So one is equivalent to two. Okay. And what about case three? Well, case three also has a very simple proof because in three, if we want to prove this, okay, what you do is you first bound this by the um, uh, L2 norm of this case, because what you're doing here is you're writing T of square root of P minus one over Q minus one as T of one over Q minus one composed with T square root of P minus one. 
and you're using this thing here. And so the first operator is an operator with say, with the new P equals two say, because this is supposed to be square root of P minus one divided by Q minus one. Okay, uh, but the P is two here, so I can go to two. And now I have this. And so now this is two, which is exactly what we have here, two minus one. So it can go from P. So then this is less or equal. Done. Okay, so trivial. Uh, and these come from the cases where P or Q are equal to two. So the, P, the cases where P or Q were equal to two imply case three. And by duality, you know that one is equivalent to two. So we only need to prove this case, okay? Okay, and this was what we had, and then I just raised everything to the power Q. Okay, so now I can tailor, apply Taylor expansion to this, or binomial expansion, because these norms are no longer modulized. These are no longer modulized. These are just parentheses. These numbers are positive. And so I can apply binomial expansion and so the binomial expansion here would be what? Will be square root of P minus one, Q minus one raised to the power K and then B to the power K and then Q choose K, okay? And the way you understand this is just by open it as factorials. So this thing is Q, Q minus one, dot, 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 Q minus K plus one divided by Q factorial. That's the definition of that, okay? And then you, you will have the same expansion for this term, but however, you have this minus here, which will introduce a minus one to the K here, minus one to the K, okay? And so in the end, you realize that this thing is just summation of QK, B to the K, uh, square root of P minus one over Q minus one. Let me write, this is this, K over two, and then K greater or equal than zero, but even only the even terms survive. And the same thing here. Yeah. Okay. However, and so this is the interrogation. I don't know if that is true. Uh, but I do know that this thing is less or equal than, let me rewrite this as one, which was the first term, and then I put the two here. And the same thing here. Okay, so this is in the form of one plus T raised to some theta. Theta is this guy, which is less than one. Okay, so this is less or equal than one plus theta times t, and that works for any theta greater or equal than zero, okay, which is our case. This is greater or equal than zero. And so I can just bound this by one plus summation of two even of qk. Well, let me already replace by 2k and just put bigger or equal than one p to the 2k and then p minus one, q minus one to the k. And then the question, if this is less or equal than this. Okay. And the claim is that that is true. And not only is that term by term, 
they are true. So this thing, oh, I forgot to put the P over Q here that came from this exponent here. So claim P over Q, K two K, P minus one, Q minus one to the power K is less or equal than P two K for all K greater equal than one. Okay, so let's see if that is true or not. Um, so, so let's expand this. This is Q, Q minus one, up to q minus 2k plus 1 divided by 2k factorial. And we also have this p divided by q multiplying and this p minus 1 to the k, q minus 1 to the k. And on the right hand side, we have p, p minus 1 dot dot dot. Maybe should I will even put the q minus 2 dot dot dot. Q minus two dot dot dot, Q minus two K plus one divided by two K factorial. And that's it. Okay, so that's the question. And well, this term cancels with us. So let me erase. Uh, let me cancel this guy with this guy. And let me cancel this guy with this guy. Let me cancel one of these powers with this guy and one of these powers with this guy. Okay, so uh, you can rewrite this as so that so so that was the question now. Then this is equivalent to say that Q minus two. Okay, so what's going on here? How many terms do we have here? We have from two to two K minus one. So we have two K minus two terms. Okay, so they're even. So I can swipe, I can flip, sorry, all of these. And I will keep these uh, Q minus one to K minus one here below, uh, which I can rewrite as, because we had two K minus two terms. So I can put square root here. I can put square root here and in all of them. And I do the same for the other. And the question if that is true. And so, and so you see, well, indeed, actually, we have that this thing is true. Yes, this is true. And this works for any j greater or equal than two. And how can you see that? Um, it's actually pretty simple. You just consider the function f, say x equals j minus x divided by square root of x minus one for say one less than x less than two. Okay, which is the case. And then I want to know if f of q is less than f of p. And if we show that the function is decreasing, then it's fine because q is bigger than p. So I just have to compute the derivative of this guy. And so it's negative. Um, but let's see that. Well, if you compute the derivative, you get minus square root of x minus one 
minus j minus x, and then you have to differentiate that guy. So you get this guy here with a plus and the a half here, yes. Okay, and then here x minus one. So if you multiply everything, you get x minus one plus a half j minus x divided by x minus one, three halves. And then you see that this is equal to um, one plus, am I doing this right? Let's see. Oh, this was not, this was minus, sorry. This was minus. So we get what? One minus j over two, and we get minus x over two divided by x minus one, three halves. And then you see that, um, well, if j is greater than equal than two, which it is the case, this is negative and x is positive. So this whole thing is negative. And so therefore, this is indeed true. And if that is true, then these inequalities, now these terms are all positive because Q is less than two. And that was the important bit to, to use only this case and P is less than two. So this all, you have, you have done like, because we have flipped these guys, but we have done like an even amount of flips. So the inequality is still in the same direction. And also each of these terms are positive. So if I bound this guy by this guy, then I bound this product by this product. And we just did that. Okay, so that finishes the proof. So basically hyper real hyperconductivity just follows by Taylor expansion, say, or binomial generalized binomial theorem and some very trivial estimates, okay? but still is a very powerful result with a bunch of applications out as we've seen so far. And I would like to describe yet another one. Okay, let me describe some other applications. of hyperconductivity. Um, oh, so recall, for instance, recall that the influence of the variable i of a function f is just the expectation of the derivative, the expectation of the square root of the derivative and uh, which can be written in Fourier setting as, as this. Um, and then we define the max influence as the maxima of these guys, we call that before we define the influence as just the sum of these guys. Okay, and then there is an important result, which is a theorem of Kali, oh, sorry, Kun, Kun, Kali, and Vignal. So in the book, it's called the KKL theorem. Almost that is for every f from the Boolean come cube uh, for every Boolean function, uh, we have that the max influence of your function is greater or equal than some constant, the variation of a function. Um, times 
log n divided by n. Okay. That means that there exists a variable i such that its influence is as large as log n divided by n. And if, oh, there is a variance here, but the variance is one if your function is unbiased. That is, if you recall that, let me should write here, variance of f is the expectation of f squared minus the expectation of f squared, which is one minus expectation of f squared because your function is Boolean. And so if your function is unbiased, meaning if the average is zero and the variance is just one. So this is just a factor, a correction factor that has to be there. Uh, but in any case, with this interpretation is, there is always a, a variable i whose influence is greater or equal than log n over n, okay, which is big. Uh, and this bound is sharp. Um, let me make this observation with probably proof. Uh, Oh, maybe a, a first more trivial observation is that um, variation of f is, um, well, is always greater or equal than, um, yes, max influence of f, which is always greater or equal than one over n variation of f. And so you can also regard this result as improvement of this more trivial inequality by a log n factor. Okay, so let me show this. Um, well, variation of f, you know that is this sum. And for his setting, which is greater or equal than just the sum if you fix some variable i and ask that variable object to belong to your set, which definitely greater or equal than the influence i, that's the influence i of your function. And so that gets trivially this. And for the other inequality, you start with, well, your, your, your max, influence is definitely greater or equal than the total influence, which is the sum of the variables divided by n, the average of the influences. Um, but it's also trivial. Um, but what is this? This is one over n summation of this, and you can just simply bound this by one over n and remove the size of the set. And just record the set, it's not empty, and that's one over n variation of f. Okay, so their improvement is in the lag log factor. Okay, and that comes from, that can also be shown, I think their original proof wasn't, maybe it was, I don't know, no, exactly, but the proof we're going to give is comes directly from hypercontractivity. Uh, and this bound is sharp. This is sharp and is sharp for the function tribes. So this is the function tribes. Where you split your variable in x1, x, oh, s. H of k times, oh sorry, w times s. 
So you have like a Hamming cube, which you have like W times S and you split your variables into S parts, each one belonging to the Hamming cube with W variables. And then you do an end in these variables and an or on everything, okay? And again, here we're using the identification that minus one, minus one means uh, true and plus one means false. Okay, and then so if you take, if you take W to be an integer and you let um, S to be the largest such that one minus one minus two minus W to be S, it's less so you put in a half, okay. Uh, so then this S is an S, is an S of W, of course. Then you consider the, the N's, say, and then you consider, oops, then you consider uh, HWS, okay, and tribes, Ws, okay, for this particular S and for every W. So for instance, the space of the set Ws is, this is uh, not all Ns. You have a, a, a infinite sequence of Ns for these functions, but this function will be defined in these spaces. Okay, uh, but in any case, um, you have these functions. And you can show, you can show that probability of tribes, and this is actually easy to show, it's a, just a combinatorial exercise that this is one minus one minus two to the minus W. The answer we leave as an exercise. And in this case here, when you have this choice of S, you can show that this is one half minus O of log N over N, where N is WS. Okay, and S is the S of W. So let me put it like that. Okay. And so that implies directly that, um, uh, that the variation of tribes, this particular guy, is um, one plus O of log N over N squared, because the average is gonna be this, the average is gonna be proportional to this, and then there'll be a square here. So it's basically one, and you can also show And that is problem 4.13 in the book that the influence I of tribes W with this particular choice of S is one plus, uh, well, is greater or equal than some constant log N over N, okay? Oh, it's actually, no, this is actually proportional. So it's like one plus little o of one, this. And so this lower bound is actually achievable because when you divide this by the variation and f is the tribes function, what you would have is something like this divided by this. And that is proportional to log n over n, which is the lower bound. So that lower bound is best possible, okay? Uh, 
um, so this is the best possible lower bound. So you can also so you can think of like in terms of finding the best constant, but that will be that will be it. Okay, so let me prove this, and the proof goes through the isoperimetric uh, edge isoperimetric inequality. And what is the edge isoperimetric inequality? Also, this was proved again by the same guys, which is the following. If f from h n a Boolean function, and f is not constant, then max inf of f Square equal then uh, well one divided by i two though of f squared nine one minus i two though of f where i two though of f here is just i divided by the variation the normalizing factor. Okay, um, so let me prove the KKL theorem by the edge isoperimetric inequality. Okay, and it's very simple. Um, so if I two the of f is say greater or equal than log n over 10. And by the way, I should say, and I forgot to say that the logs here on the base two. Okay. Okay, so assume this, then um, then what, what happens? Well, the max influence is greater or equal than um, the variation over n. So what is this? This guy is what? This guy is just the influence divided by the variation. And so that implies that the max influence of f divided by the variation is um, greater or equal than log n divided by 10 n, and the result is proven. Okay, because I want to prove the KKL inequality here, which it was this bound. Okay, so if not, then the max influence of f by the edge isoperimetric inequality is greater or equal than, well, this is i tilde, which it was this ratio. So if this was less or equal than zero, then I can definitely bound that by one divided by some log n squared, see? And there would be a one over 10 here that we just write as a constant. And then nine raised to minus say log n over 10, because I'm replacing by something larger. And so I'm reducing the expression. And this thing is basically, you can write this thing as basically some constant and raised to some other constant alpha divided by log squared of n. And you can check that this alpha is less than one. And so this is definitely greater or equal than log n over n. Okay, times some other constant c prime, maybe c prime here, c two primes here. And that finishes the proof. Okay, and so 
either you have already your result or you don't. And if you don't have, but you have this bound, but this bound is already enough to prove this. Okay, great. Uh, and it's a sharp because you can see, oh, this is now a very sharp proof. Why does, how it works? Because, well, you already know that you have an extremizer for this inequality, which is the tribes function. And so as long as you get it, then you know that's the best possible. Okay, so how, how we prove the edge as a parametric inequality, and that's by hyperquantitrivity. Okay, so let me prove that. It's also simple to do. Um, so what is the expectation of T1 of the square root of three of F squared? Okay, that is equal to the sum of S containing N of three minus two D S F hat of S. Okay, just, just by plain definition of the, the, the operator that we have. But this is what, this is expectation of three to the minus say S or where S is distributed like the spectrograph of F. We saw this in other classes already. And then we simply apply Jensen's inequality and we get this. Uh, this bound, but what is this? This is expectation of S, which would be then the size of S times the probability of being S, which is mod y of F squared. So this is just equal to three minus the influence of F. Okay, so you can already see where this nine raised to something appears. But another way of writing this is by, well, so the edge hyperparametric inequality assumes the function is constant. So we assume that F is unbiased. That is, this guy is zero. Uh, and then you, I will leave as an exercise to finish when this is, when this is uh, not zero, okay. So if that's the case, then, well, okay, we have this sum. Let me upper bound it by one third. So, so far I didn't do anything by doing this. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is just multiply by the size of your set. So you are, you are indeed upper bounding it. And then you can rewrite this as summation in I equals one to N summation in I belonging to S of three one minus S F hat of S squared. And what is this? This is the, um, again, the expectation of this operator. Okay, but apply to what? Apply to the derivative. Because recall the derivative i of f has an expansion, which is this one. Okay, so when I multiply by this guy, I will get these factors because the set is gonna be the last one because you're removing something and only I belonging to S, so it's exactly this, okay? And so by hypercontractivity, what we have is um, summation I equals one to N of the expectation of the derivative I to what? Um, so what's, so this is L2 norm, which is fine, I'm going to L2, so, um, um, 
what I'm doing. Um, so I'm applying t square root one of zero root of three, so I can, so this is two. And let me just, Yeah, so we have this, and so we are applying now hypercontractivity for maybe right here for p equals four thirds, q equals two, and the whole equals one over three and square root of three. Okay, and then so what's whole? Whole is going to be square root of p minus one divided by two minus one. And this is exactly one over root three, which is this guy here. And so the norm two is gonna be bounded by the norm four thirds and raised to three over four, but since we had a square there already, so it'll be three over two. Great, but then you realize something which only happens for Boolean functions, it, which is what's the derivative i of f? Uh, well, this is, either plus one if they have um, um, well I mean right here so what's the derivative i of f just to recall is f of x when i equals one minus f of x when x i equals minus one and you divide by two so you conclude that the moduli of the derivative first of all it doesn't depend on the variable x y but also this is always zero or one in moduli. Okay, so it to any power equals itself. So this thing <laughs> equals just by the fact you're dealing with Boolean functions. And that's the sort of a trick that happens all the time. You can just replace this by square if you like. Okay, and this is then now the sum of the influences, but raised to three halves. So I can then bound this by the max influence. And then the sum of to uh, max influence to a half and then the sum of the guys, which will be just the influence. Okay, so putting everything together, you get that um, max influence of f is greater or equal than nine times nine minus, because you have to raise the square to take this a half out, to raise both sides to the square. So the nine shows up, this other nine shows up, and you have this divided by this is squared which is what we wanted to show because here I'm assuming that this is zero, which is the same to say that variance and so variance of F is one because the expectation would be zero. Another way to say this is that expectation of F is zero. Okay, so this is exactly what we wanted to show. And again, it comes from hypercontractivity. And this edge is a parametric inequality has a bunch of other applications as well. You can go through the book and do this as a reading exercise. It explains a bunch of other applications. And that's all I have for today. And see you next time. <laughs>